Oh, it's recording. I have to... Okay. So, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Diego Scaldaci. I work uh, for the EGF Foundation as technical solution lead. And I'm also involved, with, involved in the EOSCAB project where I'm co chairing the activity management board. Uh, this, my, this presentation is mainly to introduce you this session and the speaker that uh, we will present today. Uh, before we start, some housekeeping rule. The session is being recorded. Uh, please stay muted and keep your video off during the presentation. And you can ask your question in the chat during the session. Okay, then um, this uh, session is split in two main parts. In the first part, we'll have uh, a presentation on the current draft of the EOSC interoperability framework that is being developed by the, FAIR, the EOSC FAIR and the Architecture Working Group. This presentation will, give, will be given by Magnus Erickson and Mark van der Sanden. Mark is also the EOSC Hub representative in the EOSC Architecture Working Group. They will uh, present the current status of the activities and uh, in, in addition, uh, the relations between the work EOSCAB is doing on the technical architecture and in the developing of uh, interoperability guidelines with the building blocks uh, would be uh, connected and make related to this uh, effort from the FAIR and the architecture working group. In the second uh, part of the session, instead, we will uh, we'll go into more details about the architecture and the guidelines EOSCAB has developed for some key building blocks, in particular for the cloud computer containerization orchestration. This will be presented by Ron Fernandez from EGI. For the path solution, uh, the presenter will be Mari Cantonacci from INFN, and the platform for processing that uh, will be presented by Lucas Gupta from Cypheret. I'd like also to use this, uh, this time to remind you about the survey that uh, we have launched on the EOSCAB uh, specification interoperability guidelines. Uh, we launched two surveys to cover the guidelines that we developed for the federation services that are the services that are candidate to be part of the future EOSCOR. Another survey focused on the common services that are uh, services that are candidate to be part of the future EOS exchange. Uh, the, um, this feedback collection is open until this consultation is open until uh, the end of this month. So I'd like to invite you to have a look and provide your feedback since this would help us on uh, enhancing these guidelines uh, to align them with the needs of the future EOS users. That's all from my side, and uh, I'd like to give the stage to Magnus and Mark, and Mark to present, uh, to introduce the EOSC interoperability framework. Okay, Magnus uh, will start. Stop um, sharing. Okay, so now you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Uh, okay, so my name is Magnus Eriksson and I'm from the EOSC Fair Work Group and uh, I will be presenting together with Mark van der Sanden uh, and he's from the Architecture Work Group, but we both uh, uh, are members of the uh, interoperability, the EOSC interoper interoperability task force. So uh, uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our work on the ESC interoperability framework, uh, what we have done so far and where we are right now. So uh, in the spring 2020, this spring, we released an interim report where we identified the general principles that should drive the creation of the EOSC interoperability framework. And we uh, organized that into the four layers, layers of interoperability that are uh, usually used. Uh, uh, and it's also based on the European interoperability framework, the technical, semantic, organizational, and legal interoperability layers. For each of these layers, we uh, created a catalog of problems and needs, uh, challenges and high level recommendations. Uh, and we uh, propose these, uh, that they should be considered in the development of the EOSC interoperability framework. And uh, all this work was based on interviews with the uh, uh, infrastructures and EOSC projects 
uh, together with the literature review. So we, re we uh, released this for consultations. And um, uh, the main comments we got that there was a need for a more technical framework uh, description. And uh, there was also propositions to extend the, uh, the to do an extension of the AERA, the European Interoperability Reference Architecture, uh, that is uh, also based upon the European Interoperability Framework. So what we did was that we did uh, start working on an extension to meet uh, the consultation requests. Uh, and we're going to present to you uh, a little bit of that work today. Uh, the, the AERA is uh, modeled in Archimate. So uh, if you, when you do the extension, you do an Archimate model. Uh, but today we're going to present it in, in PowerPoint format, but we have an RG file that we are working on too. Okay, so first the starting point uh, for this work. Uh, we wanted to create a reference architecture that support fair progress for different domains, starting at different points of fairness. Uh, that is, uh, different scientific domains have uh, different, different uh, maturity levels on when it comes to the, the different uh, FAIR principles. So we wanted to be able to support both of those who have, uh, not, uh, who have a, a low level of maturity at a certain principle and those that have a high level of maturity. So uh, it, one domain could have a, a very, be, um, they could be working a lot with the uh, interoperability. Uh, uh, the interoperability principle, but maybe less with the uh, accessibility and, and so forth. So we wanted to support uh, everything. We wanted to create a reference architecture that is designed with extension in mind because we wanted to be able to evolve this with community input. And as I said, we wanted to use the European interoperability, interoperability reference architecture, the AERA as a starting point, and then adopt for, for differences between the domains because there are uh, a lot of overlaps, but there are also a lot of differences. So we wanted to be able to adopt for that. And as you see on the picture here, uh, always room to grow. We want to consider uh, fair and fairness to be a, a journey. So we want to support that process. Okay, first, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the European interoperability uh, framework, but uh, if not, we, I thought we could have a short recap. Uh, they divide the interoperability into uh, four different layers, legal, organizational, semantic, and technical, where uh, legal interoperability is about how to achieve interoperability when it comes to licenses, copyright, data protection, GDPR, organizational interoperability, uh, how to achieve interoperability when it comes to uh, policies, governance uh, structures, and rules of participation, as an example. But today we are going to talk about the lower two levels, uh, the semantic interoperability and the technical interoperability. And the semantic interoperability layer is about interpretation of meaning and metadata and ontologies. And uh, the technical is about uh, frameworks, infrastructure uh, and services. Just a short recap. Okay, so first I'm going to present uh, the work on the semantic view, and then I will leave the word to Mark that will continue on the technical view. Uh, so I thought I would start out with a, a short uh, use case here uh, to introduce uh, the work, where we have a, a study doing uh, research on rare diseases, and they are looking for clinical register data using EOSC in order to reach the population, population size that they need to study this uh, rare disease. Uh, the study need to find data sets with clinical outcome data that are interoperable, uh, interoper interoperable with the study population that they uh, want to use and the study variables that they created for the rare disease population. Uh, so they go about this uh, looking for uh, data sets in a metadata catalog and they use minimal metadata uh, to find the candidate data, data, data sets. Then they uh, further look into the metadata catalog to uh, analyze the candidate data sets in detail to find out if they are interoperable with the study population. And in this case, uh, the populations are described in the metadata catalog, uh, also with a semantic mapping to a semantic artifact containing a ICD-10 classification that is used to define uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the population. So they can use this to, to uh, 
uh, analyze the interoperability requirements in correlation to the study. Uh, then they will need to continue to look at a more granular level in the metadata catalog at the variable level or possibly below the variable level. And then they will, they will be looking at domain specific metadata and the metastata, metadata standards related to that. And each of these variables that they will be looking at will be provisioned as a fair digital object that is containing identifiers that can resolve into concepts within a, a semantic artifact or possibly several. Uh, and also, of course, to the domain metadata standard used. Uh, so in this case, in this, this example, uh, it will result to uh, a semantic artifact, uh, a medical terminology called SNOMED CT, and domain metadata described in one case using DDI and in another uh, using HL7 uh, Fire. So, uh, and then we go to the to the last uh, part here where, where uh, there is a need to evaluate uh, the commonalities between these uh, uh, fair digital objects uh, in order to um, uh, evaluate if, they, if it can be used to, to uh, answer the research question and, and uh, uh, be interoperable with the study population and the study variables. So they compare the populations using uh, uh, the, the information that they have from the metadata catalog and from the semantic artifacts, uh, the semantic mapping, uh, and uh, they use the persistent identifiers uh, for the fair digital objects to do this in a effective way. Uh, and in this case, they are lucky because uh, they are interoperable, so they can be used to, to uh, pool the data when setting up a workflow pipeline. So the uh, building blocks that I talked about uh, in the uh, use case here, uh, they all uh, was, uh, uh, they all related to the fair digital object. So the fair digital object contained ref references to uh, to metadata, uh, both minimal metadata, domain metadata, and th th those uh, uh, can be based on a conceptual metadata framework uh, to achieve a um, detailed definition of the meaning of the fair digital object. It points to a, a concept within a semantic artifact, and it is provided in an open format and a specified data syntax. Uh, all of this is uh, um, established in the semantic interoperability specification and uh, is uh, the functions are provisioned in a metadata catalog, semantic artifact catalog and a mapping repository. So if we look at uh, some examples here, we can see uh, an example of a metadata catalog here uh, where we can have different levels of granularity on the metadata. We can have minimal metadata that are uh, on a, a higher uh, granularity uh, with example standards like DCAT, DataCyt, etc. Uh, you can use conceptual metadata frameworks uh, like uh, ISO 11179, Provo, GSIM, etc. Uh, you provision domain metadata using domain specific standards and you use uh, an identifier scheme to hold metadata that uh, will. Uh, resolve into your identifier. And the same structure here is, uh, uh, or a similar structure uh, is described here for the semantic artifacts. Uh, I think one, one of the differences here is that the uh, different types of semantic artifacts uh, are uh, described here. Uh, and they, they uh, use uh, different le levels of formality. So if you are using maybe a lower level of formality, you might be using a data model to describe your semantics. And if you are uh, more advanced, you might be using an ontology. But we want to support all these types of semantic artifacts in order to support uh, progress uh, when it comes to the evolution of fairness. Uh, a mapping repository uh, might also be a good thing to have. Uh, if uh, uh, the uh, data sets in this case uh, that were evaluated use different metadata standards. You might need a crosswalk to see what metadata elements uh, correlate to what metadata elements in, the, in the, another standard. And uh, you might want also to have crosswalks when it comes to the semantic artifacts. Uh, in this example, uh, SNOMED CT concept 
uh, how does that relate to uh, ICD-10 code? And uh, you can also have a um, mapping, of course, between uh, the metadata uh, standards and uh, the semantic artifacts concept. Okay, so all of this is uh, built upon common frameworks. And uh, now I'm going to leave the, the word to Mark that will continue to talk more about the, the frameworks. Uh, thank you, Magnus. Uh, I'm Mark van der Zande. I'm from SURF. Uh, I'm also technical coordinator with NEO DAT. And I am the ESCAP representative member of the architecture uh, within the architecture working group. And from the architecture working group, uh, together with uh, Frederick Coppens, we have been working in the uh, EOSC interoperability framework task force. Um, next slide. Uh, from the uh, technical uh, uh, view of, of the interoperability uh, framework, uh, we have taken the starting point as uh, the Iron Lady, as far as I have understood, this called at the moment Fair Lady. Uh, and if you look at this document, uh, the, the, the basis of what is described as the minimal viable EOSC was depicted by uh, many different uh, frameworks to be supported. And I think that would be uh, a good starting point to see, okay, what would be then this framework uh, and mean? Because if you look at what is currently described in the Iron Lady, um, there is not that much details, but you can go to many details in if you want to use those type of describe those type of frameworks. Uh, next slide. Uh, another work which we also have been doing within the architecture working group is, is to describe in more details what are the capabilities of functions which are to be provided by uh, the minimal viable EOS. And this is an architecture diagram which we have been developing in the architecture working group, uh, listing uh, what would be then the core functions uh, to be provided. And if you see what is at the, uh, in between to the core functions and from the resource provider section uh, is the EOS interoperability framework. So the basis of interaction connecting uh, uh, services resources uh, with core capabilities should then be going through uh, defined standards as what is then described within the interoperability framework. But also on this level, it does not describe uh, uh, what is precisely in those frameworks, except uh, you can see uh, the different capabilities presented for which you have to define those uh, uh, interoperability standards. Uh, next slide. So what we have done is to take up uh, the uh, frameworks which are mentioned within the Iron Lady, uh, put this into a model, but also as a very flexible, a setup of this model. So we have uh, a, a framework for open science policies for the AI, for PEDs, open metrics, data access, service management, metadata security, and operational support. But in principle, you can develop many different frameworks. But the important aspect is that you have to come to a conclusion and to a decision which can framework should then be included within uh, the interoperability framework itself. But it should be a flexible model so that it can easily be extended. But also, if you look at this, the Iron Lady does not describe any details. And that is what we have to be working with. Next slide. So, for example, if you go to uh, uh, the PED framework, and this is an animated slide which needs a lot of clicking. Uh, we have been working, for example, at the EOS PED policy that has been already uh, drafted, provided, established, so that could be included within the uh, uh, PED framework itself. Uh, within the architecture working group, we have also a PED architecture task force, which describes a lot of, more, a lot of uh, architecture details for the PED framework. And this is listening many different PD types for different purposes, 
but also addressing uh, global resolving. How do you want to uh, enable this? Uh, kernel type information, what kind of information needs to be included as minimum information within the PED record. Uh, there's something about uh, a prefix or the namespace, how this is constructed within the PED framework. Of course, PED minting, because else how can you generate the PSYS identifiers, but also for such a framework in itself, you can uh, describe much more information um, for how to describe a PED framework should consist of on how should you working. Within the AI framework, uh, it is very similar. For example, within the AI task force, within the architecture working group, we have for us described what would be the first principles of an AI framework. Uh, we very much look at, uh, at the ARC blueprint and the ARC, uh, ARC guidelines. From this, we also looking at to see, okay, should we have an EOS federation for the AI? Uh, but also on the, manner, on the details, you can go to describing uh, frameworks for uh, how identity management should be done, authentication protocols, authorization protocols, and uh, more of those type of information. But uh, that should be extended. Uh, for the metadata framework, very similar. Uh, you can describe those things for the open metrics framework, the semantic framework, which is already being addressed by, uh, by Magnus. Um, I think there are some more uh, for the security framework, but also this, it is a very extendable model, which you can expand to new types of frameworks. Next slide. But then when you have all those frameworks available, how does this relate then to uh, uh, services? or to the capabilities which are to be provided by services. For this, we have been looking at how are services then being uh, described within the EOS resource catalog or the service catalog or the marketplace as being uh, described. If you look at this, you can see already a number of service type categories, and these are listed below as uh, compute the services for data management, for networking, processing and analysis, uh, security, storage, data sources, training and support, but you can, in principle, expand this also in a very flexible model if you have to have a certain type of uh, other type of services. Uh, but I go to do uh, uh, a little bit more details. I depicted uh, data management. I come from from EU Dev, so um, more looking towards data type of services. Then what kind of data management enablers would you have as basic building blocks? You can describe, for example, the digital repository and how does a digital repository is built up or for uh, data discovery, data archives, cloud storage, or PD server. But also this, I think, is a very flexible model because you can include many different kinds of building blocks. If you then go to describing uh, um, a data repository as one of the building blocks in more details, then you have to think about, okay, a data repository is about uploading data, describing data with metadata, having a persistent identifier. So there's a lot of things coming together. So you have elements of uh, metadata, metadata management, but you need the metadata being to, to enable harvesting, enable metadata search on the metadata you have, metadata indexing, but for uploading of accessing data, uh, maybe you need uh, a registration of, of users. So then you have something about identity management, authentication, authorization. Uh, but you can go in much more details, for example, licensing. What kind of licensing do you support to provide access to the data? But also what is the acceptable use policy for the service in itself or the data privacy statement, which is still required for the GDPR. Uh, but also different kinds of other capabilities can be provided as annotations. Uh, how do you access the data for which type of protocols? How do you store the data? Which kind of metrics are to be provided? And for example, do you have a trusted digital repository? And according to which certification mechanism, mechanism is your repository then certified? But how does this then relate to uh, the, the frameworks? And I think 
there it comes closely together because within a building block, you enable many diff different capabilities. First, those capabilities are then related to the different frameworks and different standards which are to be provided. For example, if you look at the metadata standards, you should follow the metadata framework. For identity management or authentication authorization, you follow the AI framework. Uh, for acceptable use policy, data privacy, maybe these are located in the security framework. Data access process protocols are then related for data access framework. But within this framework, you have data access protocols for different purposes. One for digital, rep digital repositories, maybe others for just uploading and storing data. So in this case, you can see that the interoperability framework will set the standards while the different uh, building blocks uh, enable capabilities on basis of standards provided by uh, the frameworks, but always in a generic way, because these are not the solutions, because the solutions are built by uh, the communities, by the resource providers, but these will provide the guidelines to which uh, resource providers, service integrators can work to enable certain capabilities or to integrate uh, uh, services and resources which they want to connect to each other. And therefore, I think if you look at the initial approach taken by uh, also ESCUP in defining uh, building blocks, describing main features, I think there the work which we have been doing within the architecture working group, within the uh, ESC interoperability task force, the very much comes uh, together and we very uh, much uh, follow similar approaches only we have a different starting point. Within EOSCAP, we started from the building blocks while from uh, the interoperability task, uh, interoperability task force, we started from the framework point of view. Next slide. Uh, what are the, the, the recommendations to, to go further? Because the, uh, the task forces, but also the, architect the, the working groups are coming to an end by the end of this year. Uh, so how do we go further? And what are the recommendations which we got? Is that um, for, uh, depending on the audience, more technical details are to be provided. And therefore we have developed a structure but we still have to go further in more, much more technical details. And I think there we can look at what uh, uh, EOSCAP has been doing with the architecture guidelines, because there, there are already many technical details being provided within those guidelines. Um, for establishing such an interoperability framework, it is not what you do once. You have to maintain this because technology evolves so you have to provide structures that you can able to maintain what are the current standards, but also that you can evolve to new frameworks, new standards, uh, but that you be governed in a, in a certain way. And I think within EOSC, this type of governance structure should be provided. But it should be somewhere an open structure so that uh, communities, uh, infrastructure providers, e-infrastructure providers, research infrastructure providers can participate in establishing, in establishing and evolving such a framework. Uh, community consultation is, is very much needed because many standards are already provided, many standards are already being adopted uh, by, by communities and we have to see how can you evolve and how can you integrate this uh, within the EOS interoperability framework itself. And I think there also within uh, EOSCAP, we provide some kind of structure that you have some basic builder blocks, but you can also have community specific guidelines uh, to promote it through the EOSCAP interoperability framework. Uh, uh, I want to thank Marcus for presenting. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Magnus and uh, Mark. Any questions from the audience? There is one actually by In Chen. Uh, I can read them aloud if you like. So this interoperability framework makes sense, but do you also consider the demotion of performance, efficiency, and effectiveness? Uh, sure, Marcus, if you want to answer, I should answer. Uh, I think you can take the question if you want. 
Okay. Um, I, I think uh, the, the, if you look at the performance or the efficiency of, efficiency of services, that is more depending on the solutions built by the communities because the communities will have to adapt to which type of criteria uh, they need to provide uh, the, the, the capabilities to, uh, uh, to, the, to the users, to their users. Uh, but you can provide some basic guidelines uh, on, on how to look at this or maybe certain technologies are uh, better for certain use cases, uh, certain cir circumstances or at different scales uh, as, as others. So I think you can provide some basic uh, information on this on basis of, of, of ready uh, uh, knowledge or standards which are provided or experiences. Uh, but for the implementation aspect, I think it is more depending on uh, the communities themselves or the services, the service developers uh, to uh, support their users. Thank you, Mark. Any um, further question? I also take the opportunity to mention that speaker participants now can uh, unmute. I suggest you unmute or raise your hand and then we'll unmute you in case you want to intervene. So this is also for you, Jean, in case you want to raise any other points. Thank you, Sarah. It seems, it seems that there are no further questions. So I, I would uh, I would thank uh, both Magnus and uh, Mark for this very nice presentation. I'm uh, looking forward uh, to to further collaborating uh, with the um, interoperability task force, the interoperability task force from uh, your scab. Thanks again. Let's move to the next uh, speaker. That is uh, Enon Fernandez from the Asia Foundation. Uh, and all will describe the, um, the interoperability guidelines EOSCAP developed for cloud compute, containerization, and orchestration. And all? You are muted? Yeah, now, now it should be. Yeah, now everything okay. is fine. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you, Dino. So um, I, I will I will dig a bit into the technical specification of uh, some of the services that we were we are supporting in EOSAP, and mainly of the cloud compute. Um, so so let's get to it first. A, a bit of context or, or where we where we are locating the services in, in kind of a stack of, of scientific application. So. Most of, I mean, this is not something that every application follows, but uh, there are lots of them that follow this kind of a structure. We have a, like a gateway or portal or kind of a more end user facing uh, interface where, where the user just interacts with, and that normally triggers the execution of some workload in, into the resources. Uh, the resources are here in the bottom. So we have in, in this yellow box, we have different kind of resources. And normally what to interact with those resources because they are different kinds of them, even different providers supporting them and so on. You normally have in the middle, some kind of orchestration or workload management um, layer that allows you to, to deal with uh, the different providers of with the heterogeneity of those providers. Um, so that's kind of the top context. And, and here in the, in the lower layer, we have resources that are presented in different abstractions. In the EOS hub, concretely, we have uh, infrastructure service as virtual machines. We have containers also you know, as infrastructure service. We also have high throughput compute, which would be the, let's say the classical grid, but others could be, could be included here. For example, HPC could be a, a possibility. Although in EOS hub, we, we don't have, um, that kind of, of services so far. Um, so I will cover these ones in, in the red box and the infrastructure as a service orchestration. So let's, let's get to it. The first one would be the cloud infrastructure as a service virtual machine management. And this is, I would say, kind of the classical infrastructure as a service, what you can get in, in most of the cloud providers out there. This is API-based access to computing resources as virtual machines that you can use for running anything that you want. 
you are able to decide the operating system and you can also decide um, the, the size of the hardware for that virtual machine. The virtual machine starts from a virtual machine image and can access some block storage for, for pers pers persistency. Some providers include this block storage as a different service, others not, just for simplicity, we're including this block storage here in, 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 this, uh, in this category also. So it's kind of just putting everything together to simplify things. Uh, this kind of services provide an API and, and we, the users of these APIs uh, are the, let's say, infrastructure service virtual machine manager users. So are the ones that create the virtual machines uh, and attach the block storage to them and, and run whatever they need to run. And then we have, let's say, the, the end researcher, the, the user goes uh, normally through a different kind of interface to interact with those VMs. It can be through a web application, can be SSH, can be in principle, can be anything. Uh, normally these kind of, of users are separated, especially when, when things grow and things become more complex. You have normally someone that is deploying the platform and running things for you, and then you have the users. In let's say in the more uh, in the smaller use cases or the long tail of sciences, normally uh, it's also happening that the platform users and the and the users deploying the virtual machines are the same. Um, so for interoperability here, we have like two big uh, considerations here. So we have, first you need to have API-based access. If you don't have API-based access, the interoperability is, is really hard to achieve. So if you are, if you consider a service that allows you to run VMs just by clicking in a dashboard you know, with a graphical user interface, that's, that's really useful, but it will not be easy interoperable with, with anything else because it's just clicking around. So you need uh, some kind of API based access. And here we prefer open and standard APIs. There are several around. Um, we, we, we are not prescribing a single one, but we, we know there are things like OpenStack, Open Nebula. There are standards like OCC or, or CIMI. We, we prefer those kind of open standards um, uh, APIs. And in order to have, let's say, a better interoperability, we rely on the orchestration layer for making it easier to move workloads from one cloud to another or to interact with different clouds in a, in a common way. The second big block would be the, the AI, the authentication authorization infrastructure. And basically what we are saying here, in order to have a, a cloud infrastructure as a service, virtual machine management service, you need to allow users authenticated with the following the EOS Hub AI guidelines, which mainly means in our case, following OpenID Connect um, and, and connecting to the EOS Hub AI systems for, for authentication. In the case of these systems, we have a bit of extra interoperability that can be considered, which is the federation one. And this is uh, thinking on, on a system where you have several providers of cloud infrastructure as service that join together to support a given community, join together in a, in a federated way. And here we have a bit of, as I said, extra interoperability things to, to take into account. AI would be kind of the same that I said before, just being a bit more specific. We are talking about OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect for, for the federated entity. Uh, and then we have three more features that are really relevant for, for federation that make it uh, really uh, helpful for, for, for user communities and also for the providers uh, to manage the, the whole thing as, as, a, as a single service or as a collection of, of cooperating services. So the first one will be the federated virtual machine image management that allows you to have the software at the different providers uh, in an easy way. And here we use for interoperability, the HEPIX image list. Basically, this is the, the only standard that we are, we are aware of. And that's uh, what we are proposing. For the accounting, that means uh, being able to collect usage information from the, from the different providers in a central place. We are uh, proposing uh, for interoperability two 
records based on, on the OEF standards. So we have the virtual machine accounting record that is based on the OEF usage record and the uh, OEF storage accounting record that, that's uh, already a, a standard. So those are, are the two specifications that the cloud sites that want to be federated need, need to comply with. And for discovery, that is publishing information about the, the capabilities and capacities of the, of the providers, we propose uh, for interoperability the, the OEF Clue Schema 2.1 that has a, a very long list of, uh, of uh, detailed information about uh, the, as I said, the capabilities and capacity of the providers. Uh, some examples of these services in, in the EOS portal that are uh, basically interoperable, that are following, I providing this kind of APIs, open APIs for accessing. All of these are relying basically on OpenStack and, 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 and can, be, can be used directly with those APIs. And we have things like Crowfero that comes from a commercial uh, company that is part of the EOS staff. We have the AGI Cloud Compute Federation that besides the, the basic interoperability, it's also meeting the, the federated uh, part of it. And we have another example, this is the CSC Community Cloud, that uh, it's also a, a cloud infrastructure service virtual machine uh, provider uh, available in, in EOSC. Moving to the orchestration layer that allows you to manage set of resources as, as code. So here, uh, if you see at the, in the um, picture, we have some orchestration user that would be these people managing uh, the platform that the end users will use. They submit some kind of infrastructure description to the orchestrator, and that will uh, automatically deploy it at the different providers manage. So here, um, I have the next slide just with text, but uh, uh, as works also here. We have as um, infrastructure description, the main standards for interoperability that we have is Tosca. Um, we propose uh, using the, or being interoperable with the EOS Hub AAI in order to authenticate users. Um, the APS that should be supported, well, we, uh, as before, we prefer open and, and standard APIs. OpenStack is the main one that we have in EOS Hub, but others are welcome. And, and here we don't have a, clear common API, there is no standard as far as uh, uh, as we know. And so we don't have a clear recommendation on, on the API here. Just kind of the same body in text. So big or, or the main things in this orchestration is treating infrastructure as code, which brings a lot of, of benefit uh, because you can have a really good control of what's deployed. You can do reviews, you can, store that kind of uh, uh, information in a repository with the version control and so on. And as I said, Tosca is here the, the main standard that, that uh, uh, we see. The other big topic here would be supporting different backends or cloud vendors. So this layer of orchestration allows you or allows the users to, to have interoperability of the underlying providers. As I said before, we prefer these standard open, uh, open APIs, but of course, we live in a, in a world where, where there is a lot of cloud providers, commercial cloud providers, and that can be very, very helpful also for, for scientific or research users. So it's, it's very interesting that this kind of orchestration also support this proprietary APIs like Amazon, Google Cloud, or Azure. And, and as I was saying before, the AI, the EOS Hub AI should be supported for authentication into the backends mostly. Again, this is allowed to open AV Connect. And, and there is no clear standard available for the orchestrator API. Uh, and as an example of the orchestration on the EOS portal is mostly in, in the, this one, the infrastructure manager that is also part of the EOS Hub project. Um, so this is mostly, well, mostly not, it's com complying with all of the, the interoperability guidelines that I was mentioning before. And the last one would be the cloud infrastructure as service container management. And this is about running container-based applications on top of some kind of orchestration of, of containers. There are several platforms, let's say in the market, we have Kubernetes, Swarm, Mesos, and, and possibly others. But what we have seen is that Kubernetes is coming the, the de facto standard. 
Um, so just to explain a bit the figure, we have this uh, user, which is the, the manager of the platform to be deployed, interacts with uh, some API of, of the container orchestration API, and that will make it make the magic to, to deploy the containers on top of the infrastructure. In this picture, I have included here an infrastructure as a service, like managing the resources, but it can be also bare metal or it can be deployed manually. So it really depends. The, the main thing would be this box here with the container orchestration API that the user interacts with. As I said before, there are several uh, container orchestrators that are available. They, we, I, I think we cannot say this is the one to follow. What we have seen is that Kubernetes is kind of becoming the de facto standard and now it's supported on, on every uh, big cloud provider out there and, and in lots of research providers also. So it's it's kind of becoming the one. Uh, there are also some some other things to, to consider. So these services should support the open container initiative image and, and runtime specs for, for container execution. So they should support the, the standard containers uh, available out there. They should support again the US Hub AI. And if the service is able to manage underlying infrastructures as a service resources, VMs, it should support the ones in, in, in EOS Hub so it, it can talk to the existing system. That means OpenStack in the case of, of EOS Hub. And that, yeah, that's the almost last slide. This is the examples that we have in the EOS portal as, as this kind of service. We have the EEI Cloud Container Compute that comes on top of the EEI Cloud. And we have a similar uh, product from, from CSC that both of them are deploying Kubernetes for the user. And then the user can go and, and run their applications on top of Kubernetes. And that last slide is uh, other relevant technical specifications because it's not just the cloud compute. We have other ways of dealing with compute. So we have the HPC, HPC area, high throughput compute and high performance computing, where we have several specifications on how to deal with this kind of uh, computing infrastructures. We also have the platform as a service that uses the, the cloud for lots of, uh, of things. And we also have the workflow management and user interfaces that at the end also rely on, on, on the cloud for, for lots of stuff. And with that, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, and all for the nice presentation. I think uh, we can skip the questions. It's a bit late, and we can have a unique question session at the end of all the presentation about the technical specification. Uh, now I would move to Marika Antonacci from INFN that will present the interoperability guidelines for platform as a service solution. Marika, please try to to stay within 10 minutes since we are late, okay? Ravika, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. In full screen, right? Mm, not in full screen. Okay, but uh, they are visible, I hope. Okay, yeah. so... Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Marika Antonacci from INFN Bari. I'm going to talk about uh, the technical specification for the PASS solutions area. And uh, I will try to stay in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, OK, this is the, uh, the outline of my presentation. I will go through the uh, macro features and functionalities for uh, uh, the PASS solutions. Then uh, I will uh, present uh, the reference architecture, the standards and protocols that we have uh, identified, uh, and uh, on top of which we have uh, defined uh, some interoperability guidelines. Uh, first of all, a few words about uh, the context. Uh, the, PASS, uh, the PASS area embraces uh, a wide range of uh, solutions and services uh, that allow to build uh, value-added uh, applications on top of YAS uh, functionalities and uh, capabilities. So starting from that, uh, we have uh, identified a set of key fun functionalities 
um, group da under uh, the generic um, umbrella definition uh, cloud uh, of advanced cloud service orchestration. Um, the pass uh, solutions in our vision, but this is a, a general uh, a general understanding, implement uh, an, an abstra abstraction layer on top of uh, uh, multiple uh, YAS providers, uh, um, providing uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, automating uh, the provisioning and configuration of uh, uh, cloud resources, but not, not only cloud. Um, like networks, uh, servers, uh, storage, uh, and then operating system, middleware, and data storage capabilities that are necessary to, um, to host and run the user's application. Um, this uh, abstraction is enabled through uh, the automatic discovery of uh, cloud compute and storage providers, uh, their capabilities and service availability. And the pass so enables uh, uh, the seamless access to uh, different uh, and heterogeneous uh, uh, computing environments uh, from uh, private clouds uh, like uh, OpenStack of Nebula to public clouds like Amazon, Azure, Google to even HPC sites. Uh, eventually managing uh, the automatic, uh, auto the automatic uh, scalability of the resources uh, uh, and the support for extending uh, the deployed uh, user workload across uh, uh, geographically distributed sites uh, and uh, thus providing uh, um, advanced network orchestration uh, capabilities, uh, creating overlay networks to connect uh, nodes in different sites. Um, the past layer features advanced uh, scheduling capabilities um, that are aware scheduling to take into account the data location when uh, scheduling the deployment re requests. Um, it supports uh, uh, the um, special hardware requirements uh, like uh, GPUs, FPGA, and InfiniBand uh, that are needed to run the user applications and also uh, provides uh, a mechanism to address uh, the deployment failures, uh, rescheduling automatically the deployment to another site. Um, it also supports a complex workflow involving also data orchestration and movements, uh, providing uh, uh, policy-driven data management uh, and handling uh, uh, quality of service for data replicas. Of course, these are functionalities uh, and capabilities that are provided by uh, the data services uh, that are federated uh, under uh, the, pass, uh, uh, the pass layer. So uh, in our vision, the pass provides uh, interfaces for deploying container-based infrastructure and cloud-native stacks, uh, supporting uh, um, complex topologies like uh, Kubernetes, uh, Mesos, uh, HT Condor, and so on. Um, it provides also support for on-demand application deployment, both uh, long-running service, services and batch-like jobs, allowing also to adopt a DevOps approach. And finally, it can provide uh, support for function-as-a-service workflows uh, it has to execute code uh, in response to some uh, events, uh, such as a trigger uh, preprocessing job uh, when uh, a new data is available somewhere in some um, storage area. Um, this is uh, the high level uh, reference arch architecture. Um, yes. Um, the uh, high-level ar architecture uh, that we have uh, defined uh, for the, the PASS solution. Um, as you can see, it, it uh, consists of different building blocks. Uh, there are some core components um, that are uh, um, highlighted by the blue, blue box um, under the uh, orchestration, uh, um, orchestration uh, label. Um, and these are uh, the uh, API server that provides uh, uh, REST endpoints to manage the deployment requests. Uh, the workflow engine 
uh, that uh, manage uh, the uh, deployment workflow itself. Um, and message bus uh, that provides a way uh, for integrating uh, services uh, in a loosely way and uh, it's based on uh, uh, notifications uh, um, events. Uh, then there are uh, a set of uh, plugins uh, that allow the, um, uh, the, 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 the integration with the different uh, and the federation of the different uh, um, underlying uh, uh, YAS providers. Um, so we have uh, uh, foreseen uh, uh, connectors for uh, uh, the cloud providers, uh, um, connectors for uh, uh, the uh, container orchestration platforms, uh, and also uh, uh, connectors for uh, uh, HPC uh, sites. Um, that should implement uh, the interface uh, that uh, uh, for, for interacting with uh, uh, the HPC uh, services. Um, and then we have also connectors for uh, the storage services uh, uh, to um, interact with uh, the relevant storage management and orchestration services. And this, this, this interaction is, of course, based on the REST APIs that are provided by uh, the storage uh, services themselves, uh, as I anticipated before. And moreover, uh, here you can see also uh, the dependencies uh, uh, towards uh, uh, some federation, uh, um, core federation services. Um, we have, of course, uh, a strong dependency on uh, the EOSCAD AAI, on the, uh, on the AAI part. Um, to ensure that uh, the federated uh, um, to ensure uh, uh, the federated access to to the services and the, the resources, uh, we have also um, dependency uh, towards uh, the information system in order to um, to get uh, uh, information about the providers uh, and their uh, capabilities. Um, a dependency towards uh, the monitoring and also the marketplace. And uh, concerning the standards, uh, as uh, also um, anticipated by, by Enol in his presentation, um, we, uh, we think that uh, TOSCA is the main uh, standard for uh, um, the description of the um, cloud applications. Um, and uh, this is a, a standard also for the orchestration part. Um, it, is a, um, uh, it is designed to be extensible and uh, um, allows to um, adopt, a, um, to, allows to, to promote uh, the uh, service composition pattern. Um, it also announces the portability and the operational management of the, the applications and, uh, and services across their entire uh, life cycle. And uh, it is being adopted by several uh, products, both open source and commercial, and uh, also by uh, different projects. Here you have a list of, uh, of both of them. Uh, concerning uh, the protocols and the APIs, uh, um, we are uh, uh, promoting uh, the adoption of the OAuth uh, uh, 2.0 uh, protocol for uh, the authentication and authorization part and uh, the usage of REST APIs, of clear REST APIs uh, for uh, managing uh, the uh, user deployments. Um, and uh, Concerning so the interoperability guidelines, uh, are, uh, lev uh, they leverage the identified standards and protocols uh, that by, by design aim at fostering inter interoperability. And we promote the support for multiple providers and services. And uh, finally, the interoperability can, uh, can be favored exposing uh, standardized REST APIs. For uh, the orchestration part, uh, the pass orchestration, um, there is not an official standard for the APIs, uh, but we are proposing as a reference the APIs implemented in the Indigo Pass Orchestrator. And here you can, fi can find a link to uh, the documentation of these APIs. 
concerning uh, the example of solutions already available and that support this specification, um, we have uh, in the EOS portal uh, uh, two main services uh, that already implement uh, this specification. Um, one is uh, the Indigo Pass uh, and the other is uh, the Infrastructure Manager. And the Indigo Pass uh, uh, indeed uh, um, uses uh, the Infrastructure Manager uh, to perform uh, the provisioning and configuration of resources on uh, a specific uh, cloud provider. Um, so um, the, as you can see, uh, the architecture of the, the pass orchestrator uh, is uh, quite in line with uh, the one that we are defining uh, in the technical specification. Um, uh, and uh, um, for this, uh, the technical specification that we are defining is not uh, uh, something uh, uh, unrelated to the real world, so it's uh, something practicable. And here I uh, leave the um, uh, the, the, the link uh, to, to, uh, to the two uh, services that are uh, registered in the EOSC portal and uh, can, can be uh, used and tested. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mavica, for your presentation. I would move immediately to the last uh, presentation from Unitas. The, um, the session, we are, we are standing a bit the session since we are late, we count to, to finish around 1.15, so we, if we are taking some time for your lunch. Lucas, if you can take the, the stage and please try to stay within 10 minutes so we can also have one or two questions on them. Okay, hello uh, everyone, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sharing my screen, my, my PowerPoint presentation. Um, can you tell me if you can see it full screen now? Yes, perfect. Lucas, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So I try to be, be quite concise and tell you something about what we did during the time of EOS Hub about data platform for processing. And uh, before we go into details, I would like just to depict a high level architecture of data processing platform, what it is in general. So, Technically, we have the, so this is the most vital part of any, um, any scientific ecosystems because we are talking about the data, data which is uh, input and output from the, for the processing pipelines. And if we, are, if we are in the EOSC environment, we need to think about the distributed data and distributed data repositories, digital repositories, we, the data archives. Mark was uh, mentioned about that in his presentation before. So we have like, like a, a vast complexity of the data sources, which are distributed, heterogeneous, and and delivered by the different means. But in the end, what we say the, the vital and the most critical element is how to process this this data collection, these data collections in the available processing platforms mentioned by a node, for instance, which are available in EOS ecosystem. So uh, data processing platform is a thing which is uh, combined, uh, combining the data sources and the data computational together uh, in the way that it can be uh, mean, meaningful for the, the CPU. But as Marika mentioned in the, in the platform as a service, this uh, solution which I'm talking about now is usually our part, might be a part of PASS, uh, they deploying the large ecosystem by the PASS platform. But as well, there are use cases where they can be deployed alone using just IaaS uh, or private, uh, data, private processing uh, infrastructures altogether. So what we have here, mm, we have like data sources, which are a potential place for the in, or input data. As well, we have the, the data targets, which might be of course the same uh, repository, but they, there is a place where the, the output data will come there, will go there. And we have like a distributed private, uh, distributed processing environment, uh, which might use it different technologies, Kubernetes, uh, HTC clouds, HTC clusters, and in most cases, uh, it's we are talking in EOS ecosystem. We are talking about the clouds uh, or ad hoc created clouds. So, uh, if we go further uh, and define the, the macro features, which is probably the most important element to define uh, data processing platforms, this is what we have. 
And first is like, what are the protocols? So protocols for integration uh, of data repositories and data archives. This is how the data archive, the data uh, containers, let's say, uh, uh, speak to the world. And this is like a critical. And second thing is like the APIs for the, the processing computational infrastructure. This is the thing which was mentioned by Hello in his presentation about API programmatic interfaces to, to define and configure the computational interfaces as well mentioned by Marika in her presentation about the platforms and services. Again, this is like the more complex API interfaces. So data processing platform make macro features as well uh, as a, as a uh, It's a part which requires, uh, is an element which requires to manage input and output data, as I mentioned before. So that leads to the long date, in many cases, it leads to the long distance data transfer. Of course, long distance um, uh, doesn't need to be intercontinental, in many cases it might be, but even uh, within the continent data movements for several thousand of kilometers might be uh, might be challenging in terms of the um, of the software stack which has to be used there. When we go further into the processing infrastructure and uh, the cloud infrastructure, we really hit easily a, a thing which is now defined like the software defined storages. So the, we can build ad hoc the the storage processing um, the storage interfaces in the in the cloud and for and going on further we have like the specific uh, use cases required as well based on the metadata driven um, processing or data locality based on the on some quality of service rules we mentioned by marika but the very critical element of the data processing platforms and features which has the platform fulfills is the access control rights or the way of in general security integration with the existing into the existing ecosystem. And naturally, we need to have the features for monitoring, scalability, and uh, probably the most commonly needed recently in EOSC ecosystem is the freedom of deploying and tearing down the platforms. In the case of the processing, this seems to be fairly simple. We just uh, instantiate VM or we instantiate a container, and later on, then we can delete them. But if we are talking about the, the data processing platforms, the fee, this feature is, is very essential because we need to, to deal with the results of the processing. We need to deal with the security of data, and we need to deal about the guarantee of the consistency of the data when the tearing down of the um, individual platform, uh, individual instance of the platform uh, is, has happened. So we need to guarantee that the user won't lose the, the crucial data in the end. And uh, from the, this is like uh, the last but not least, heterogeneity from the storage interfaces and transparency of data access from the application point of view is the, the holy grail of, the, of that kind of platforms. But the heterogeneity is the key because in practice, there's no way that we could have identical uh, uh, processing ecosystems in the distributed environments uh, when we are talking about the, the federations of scale like EOSC or EOSC at least. So uh, there are relevant building blocks uh, which are uh, important for the, this, this thing. We, we, we did some analytics uh, about that. And there are uh, plenty of uh, existing building blocks uh, available. Although if uh, we go, and I'm not going to read this because I don't have much time. So if I go to the, uh, the platform, uh, the platform uh, maybe the challenges platform guidelines here, I would focus on the, the essential element which has to be taken into account while we are uh, building a data processing platforms. It's either by, it might be built by pass or by individual users. First of all, we need to define protocols and interfaces or choose protocols and data interfaces to data for data access. I mean, data existing in the existing collection and la later for the data produced by the processing platform, what to do with that in the end. So 
uh, during the analy analyzing the existing ecosystem, there is a, a, a big lack of the, the nice protocols which should be which might be taken into account. But we need to work with what we have. So the, the best candidates here are WebDAV, S3, and HTTP protocols for exposing existing existing data. There are potential as well uh, working with the POSIX uh, large scale collection, uh, but the, the day requires, uh, unfortunately, of course, POSIX is uh, naturally locked in within a single data center. So that would require a usage of gateway. This is possible with some of the, the tools which are available to building blocks in the list. But the second element which has to be taken into account for the data processing platform uh, as, a, as an element uh, plan for planning is the security, which is the in the most cases the major blocker. Uh, is is extremely difficult to define that uh, in in general. So there are many um, habits depending on the ecosystem or society or the community. But trying to make the the bigger picture about that that thing is like. The first thing is the integration with existing authentication services. We speak in EOSCAP with some open ID connect protocols. Of course, it nicely would be the, the direct integration of EOSCAP AI, like a, an entry point. But the, the protocol, the, the tools which you are which you're using for the data management process must support the, the, the open ID connect or at least some. Second element is the, the authorization. In this case, there is a lack of standards uh, widely accepted. There are some protocols defined by uh, some communities, but they are not widely accepted uh, on the market. So in practice, while we go into data processing platforms in the distributed way, the custom integration will be needed anyway. So that's a, a matter which has to be taken into account while by planning the, 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 plan, the, the deployment. Third element of the security is the data transfer and encryption. It's, uh, of course, natural these days, TLS, like the, the encryption channel between point A and point B. But while we were working with these environments, we noticed that there is a, a, a tremendous security breach in the configuration of these elements uh, on the, in the systems uh, due to the problem of distributed management of the SSL certificates. Uh, in practice, if we, it's very difficult to configure uh, the environments ad hoc in the distributed clouds uh, and have automatically make this fully automated deployment and keep the SSL certificate green. So there are some on the market platforms, building blocks which supports that, but not many. This is like the element which has to be taken into account manually by the, the, the platform pass or by someone who's creating and deployment. And the last thing is like the, the data encryption at the storage level. This is like the element mentioned by many of the communities, especially with the working with the, the genomic, genomic data or uh, things related to the high security uh, standards. In practice, there is no ready-made custom building blocks which supports that because this is like the, the very complicated scenario which not only the tool needs to support them, but as well the um, instance, the, the place where we do the execution. So the data center. So this is like a combination of custom tools uh, plus policies, which has to be taken into account uh, while we are talking about the data processing, not just, not archiving, data processing uh, and keeping the encryption, uh, high level standard of encryption at the storage level. And there are two more points before I finish, uh, uh, which are worth to mention is the processing ready storage, uh, software defined storages, which are ready for scalability. And there are a few candidates uh, or building blocks there. Uh, Glass RFS, last run data, and interfaces for uh, object oriented is like the widely used S3 Swift or CDMI is the least used, but it's there. And uh, probably the glue of all whole ecosystem, this is the, the data movement engines. And there are, there are elements which has to be taken into account, how the data has to be accessed and uh, what is the frequency of the data movements. And if the file-based replication is fine, all the data on the fly is needed. So there are, there are all the possible scenarios are covered by some of the building blocks. 
but it has to be chosen widely, uh, wisely depending on the, on the scenario. In many cases, in scientific application, the data access on the fly is not uh, that needed. So we have like a, a bunch of services which can easily move the data between the locations uh, depending on the, ex the protocols and expose them uh, and save them on the local storages prepared by the pass or by the IS. So if we have this full guidelines, we take, take into account the simple full guidelines there, uh, we can build or configure the eco pro distributed data processing ecosystem properly uh, based on the available building tools. So this is like the, the, the summary. But if we have like the, the vision mention uh, a, a minimal, absolute minimal element and architecture vision, which was presented from taken from the NL slide, we have VM and we have the block storage there. So to combine all of these resources and scale these resources properly, it's worth to choose the platform which uh, supports the, I mean, the platform to, to choose the, the building blocks, the software stack, which can arrange and combine scalable the, the resources which are so defined like in this picture, VMs and block storages, nothing else. We, we can, on top of that, build a very complex ecosystems, processing ecosystems, processing platforms, but underneath, usually we, we are limited to, to this, this, this uh, elements depicted in this picture. Of course, we might have a uh, more uh, complicated scenarios taken into account Kubernetes, uh, HTC Cloud and so on, but usually, these problems are there as well. So that's that's the summary of my slide and thing. That's, that's the summary of my presentation. This is this is the end. Uh, thank you for, for the attention. I'm not sure if we have time for the questions. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, unfortunately, it's very late, yeah. so I would I would skip the questions. Uh, but I would invite everybody that are interested to contact the speaker offline in sending an email. Uh, if you want to get uh, more information. I also saw some question uh, from Yin Chen in the chat. Please feel free to send an email uh, if, you, if, you, if you can. Uh, now I'd like to wrap up. Um, the three specification and all Marika presented are part of a wider effort that USCAB did to define uh, use contemporary guidelines. Uh, there is uh, a wide set of specifications that are available in the link that I, I put in the Zoom chat. Please have a look. And uh, I'd like also to remind you, if you are interested, to provide feedback to our survey so we can improve the specification according to your input. That's all from my side. I would like to thank you to have attended this, this session. And I, I'd like also to thank again all the speakers, Magnus, uh, Mark, and all uh, Marika and Lucas. That's all. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Thank you all. And thank, thank you all you. for attending. Thank you, Diego. We bye now bye. deserve the, yeah. a lunch break, but please remember uh, you can come back at two for the other very interesting sessions that we are uh, holding. So. See you there. Have a Thank nice you. have a nice lunch. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.